hey, I'm not sure if this is a thing, but this is a video response to the video that was just uh, <clears throat> created by Cole and Ari uh, on whether or not lesbians can be non-binary or non-binary people can be lesbians. I really, really loved your video. And as a historian of lesbian sexuality, particularly in the 19th and 20th century, I actually um, wanted to offer a few additional things that I think can actually help further this discussion even more. So I'm gonna start with the, uh, the meaning of the word lesbian. So you're right that the origins of the meaning of the word lesbian go back to Sappho and the Greek island of Lesbos. But that term was not actually commonly used until the 20th century when medical experts wanted to describe different kinds of uh, sexual variations amongst humans. Um, and so they came up with all these different words, and that's actually when the word lesbian became popularized as a way to describe women who were sexually attracted to other women. The word that used to be used more commonly, and of course we're just talking about in the English-speaking world, was tribid. Uh, and tribid came from, was partly French, partly Latin. And the difference between tribid and lesbian is actually really interesting and it has a lot to do with how we think about who we are. And I think how we think about who we are is really important to unpacking the gender binary, binary and how that relates to sexuality. So tribid referred to the action, the friction of pressing pelvis to pelvis. So to be a tribid was to engage in this particular action. But what happens, well, at least historians of sexuality have been arguing this, uh, what happens in the late 19th century is that what was an action becomes a total personality or character type. So you no longer engage in same-sex activities you are a same-sex attracted person. So that aspect of your sexual preferences or desires or activities characterizes you uh, in a total way. It becomes a part of your identity. And these medical experts called that lesbian. Okay, and now here's where it gets really interesting and important, and it speaks to your point about how language evolves. So the first thing I studied was butch and femme bar culture of the 1950s and 60s because I was really uh, interested in in butches and that whole you know thing. I found it pretty sexy and pretty hot, and I wanted to know more more about it. Women who came out in that period hated the word lesbian. They never used the word lesbian. They used the word gay because to them. Gay had a positive association, and you mentioned gay in your video, whereas the word lesbian was a medical term that was used to pathologize them. It was a negative word. Um, so they do not use, and uh, many of them to this day, like they will use it for convenience, but women of that generation, they do not tend to call themselves lesbians because it just has such a profoundly negative connotation. Now I wanna take a little side trip here and just respond to you, your comment you made about people, uh, lesbians maybe not including non-binary people as being gatekeeping. So I appreciate what you're saying and in principle, and you know, maybe in practice, I agree with you, but I think it's really important that we understand that the word again, lesbian, didn't just mean same-sex attracted. In the 1970s and 80s, it was this new group of femin lesbian feminists who took the word lesbian, which had this incredibly negative connotation, and made it a positive. And that's actually when the word lesbian becomes popular amongst same-sex attracted women. Up to that point, in the 20th century, it had a very negative, very, very negative connotation. 
But they take that, just like we've seen other words being taken and flipped, like queer, for example, had a very negative connotation. And then in the 1990s, um, it gets reappropriated by the community and turned around. Um, so lesbian, uh, lesbians in the 70s did the same thing. And so they have a very, very powerful association with the word, meaning much more than just being attracted to women. It also meant uh, stepping into being a woman as not a pre an oppressed victim of patriarchy, but being empowered and self-empowering. So, so sexual, taking your sexuality, taking your life, taking your body, everything, taking all of that into your own hands. And so what I want to suggest as a historian, who I feel like I was raised by that generation, that we honor... We honor, it doesn't mean we, we, we limit the meaning of lesbian to that, but we honor the fact that for a certain generation of people, the word lesbian has meant growing up as a female, oppressed in this culture, which is incredibly toxic, and saying, no, I own my body, I own my sexuality. Um, and of course, it wasn't just lesbians doing that. But so for that generation, the word lesbian is very much grounded in being cisgender and taking ownership of their own bodies. And I think that history is really important to know uh, and important to value, um, which is not to say that that makes it okay to exclude non-binary people. Um, I'm really excited about your video because as someone who's identified as lesbian for over 30 years, now identifies as uh, non-binary. Well, actually, I was had a trans partner for 15 years. Didn't want to use the word lesbian because I felt it invalidated who they were, even though they said to me, you know, uh, feel free to use the word lesbian. But I, I was like, no. So I use the word queer. So I really like that. Um, and so this question actually really intrigues me because I come to it with a deep, deep knowledge of and respect of what the word has meant for people and what it's allowed for people to do, um, but at the same time, very aware of the way in which categories get policed. And the last thing I wanted to say, which I think is super exciting, and, and uh, I should probably talk a little bit more about this, and I think will really, really interest you, is that if you go back and read when the term lesbian was being uh, created in the 19th or late 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, you can see that actually, and this is true for homosexuality in general, both male and female homosexuality, that you can see actually that there was a kind of slippage between gender difference and uh, sexual orientation. So believe it or not, uh, butch lesbians and effeminate gay men were considered true homosexuals. They actually use that language. They were the true homosexuals. Whereas feminine lesbians, they weren't really authentically true uh, homosexuals. Um, and same as masculine men. It was just, uh, they were either a victim of the true homosexual or it was just simply convenient for them to have sex because the opposite sex wasn't available to them. Uh, that's really literally how they thought about it. And the way they theorized homosexuality in those, in those early days was that, and, and this idea didn't come from these medical experts, some of whom were queer, but it actually came from homosexual people themselves. They theorized that they were the opposite gender or soul. They didn't talk about gender at that time. They talked about having a, having a masculine soul in a female body or a female soul in a male body. And when you read this stuff from the 1800s, you think, oh, they're talking about trans. But it's not clear that it's specifically trans or gay. We can't really know. But it's very interesting to me that those two things, how you relate to your gender and being attracted to the same sex, kind of blended together into this singular identity that up until recently was homosexual. And then of course, more recently, we've had trans people defining themselves as very dis distinct. And then now, uh, which is super exciting to be non-binary people, unhinged, untethered from sexuality. So I know so many non-binary people who are attracted to um, what would have been the opposite sex. Uh, so I'm not sure what to call it, what, what they're calling, if they still identify as heterosexual or pansexual, but you don't have to be same-sex attracted anymore to sort of occupy that space and find community. So the community is growing and expanding um, and getting much, much bigger, which is always like super exciting. And I guess maybe the last thing uh, I'll say on the, this whole topic, which is what I always come back to when I talk about um, 
what the sort of homosexual agenda has been since the beginning of gay liberation and women's feminist liberation is that the critique from the, the gay liberationist point of view was always that these systems oppress all of us. So gay liberation was always also about liberating heterosexual people from gender norms and sexual norms that constrain their lives. And so this is, for me, what underlies uh, all of the work that I do. Um, I'm both a scholar, a queer historian at a Canadian university, but now I also work with non-binary people using expressive arts to figure out um, how to live a boldly non-binary life. And um, so I bring all of this uh, work and this diversity of perspectives including the historical perspective, which as a historian <laughs> is a huge commitment for me. So I really uh, hope that this uh, helps uh, add to this amazing um, conversation that you've started. And I hope we get to have more conversations together. Bye-bye.